Happy Thursday afternoon to everybody, and welcome back to the podcast with the three amigos who are here. Jason Sukumel, Alex Dunlap, who is there. Uh, good. Hey, by the way, hello, Alex. I didn't see you this morning, so good morning to you, or good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, since I didn't get to say it this morning, <laughs> having to do some having to do some running around. Gosh, traffic today. So we're getting oh. rain. Did, hey, did did we find there was no rain in the forecast, and there'd been no rain in the forecast until today did you happen to hear anything about what's going to happen with the spring game if it rains i have not heard anything but i do believe your theory would be the most accurate theory uh alex which would be if there is some sort of rain that prevents them from playing in the stadium they probably just go inside the bubble and call it a day yeah i don't think it's happened since i've worked here i don't think it's happened but there have been times where there's been a, a chance of inclement weather where mm-hmm. I believe that's what they told us. And we asked, like, can we just send one representative from each media entity in there? They're like, no, that's even. Nah, true. nah, they put it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is no way it would ever get rescheduled because of the cost involved. You want it's free to, well, they have you to only get 15 practices. Like, yeah. th- so they're not the, NC, whatever, they're not going to say, yeah, you're allowed to have a 16th practice. Well, you know. just even rescheduling it for the fans. But don't they, they have like the, some, some, is it a concert? Some singers coming in? I mean, that, that'd be a lot of logistics you'd have to cancel, dude. I bet they, I bet they just come rain or sunshine. I bet, I bet it's in the stadium and they just figure it out. Yeah, no, well, I can tell you what. There's too much. One thing I've learned from like the minute the, the athletic department to put on the because they what people would ask me before was like, hey, what about opening up the stadium, right? And like and why like watch parties during certain games? And you know, I was just told that logistically they have to hire too much security to do that kind of thing uh they've got to, they have the people who the workers in the stadium police officers that they have to hire outside of the stadium like there's a high cost involved in that and the returns aren't that great so for for people who think like oh but what if it rains maybe they'll push back the spring game another nah you get one shot that's it they only cut one check for this thing and if it doesn't happen it's inside and it just take it it's a loss as it is anyway so uh but we are only uh not only a couple of days away from the spring game guys and you know i figured maybe we can start just maybe talking a little bit about the offense since we got the modcast today we got the modcast on thursday and again mitchell yes go ahead and please hit that like button as well i figured we can talk about the offense jason and we can kind of maybe go position by position there and kind of maybe break it down maybe into a couple categories and maybe we'll develop some more organically as we're we're talking but i want to think about the people who we think about okay are these these are the incumbents who are there that we know for sure that we'll we'll check all the the boxes you maybe the people who are battling for positions and uh, and then maybe the people who are just maybe on the outside looking in at this point, right? So I want to start with quarterback with you, Jason. Mm-hmm. Quinn Ewers is the obviously unco- incumbent. He's not fighting for anything at this moment. Uh, even though Stark said Arch had a really good practice today, um, that's that's still is gonna that's not gonna mean anything when it's all said and done. Uh, but your thoughts on Quinn, not only this spring. But then maybe what you would like to see from him on this upcoming Saturday. Well, it's pretty funny because this morning on where I was on with you on your show, um, and I mentioned that was the number one thing I was looking for in the spring game was the quarterbacks, right? And my reasoning was, I said, we haven't heard like rave reviews about arts in any one day. <laughs> and I said, I said Quinn, Quinn, we've heard a couple of good things, but he's been kind of ho-hum and then, Sark comes out today and says, oh, Quinn was great at the scrimmage Saturday and Arch had his best day of practice today. So I'm like, well, damn it. I just, I should have waited to write my column until uh, Tuesday afternoon. And you were prophetic. Uh, yeah. So can't walk it back at this point, but yeah. Yeah. You know, what am I, what, what am I wanting to see from Quinn? I mean, yes, he had a really good scrimmage on Saturday. Um, a couple of people I talked to did single him out, including one of the quarterback recruits that was at the scrimmage. Uh, a couple other people I talked to, though, said, yeah, he had a good day, but like the defense actually made some good plays and a couple of his deep balls got caught up. It was a really windy day. So um, what I said this morning, I still kind of believe like we know the pecking order of the quarterbacks, right? I mean, Arch isn't pressing Quinn. No, we're not expecting that at all. But Quinn this spring, his name gets brought up a lot because he's Quinn Ewers. He's a starting quarterback. OK, we check with sources. OK, this guy threw a, you know, Quinn threw a touchdown pass to this guy or this guy. Um 
but it hasn't been other than kind of Sark today, it hasn't been like, oh my gosh, Quinn Ewers has been phenomenal all spring. He's taken it to a whole other level. Um, is that because people just kind of expect good high level play from Quinn and they take it for granted when it happens? Is that because he's still bonding and getting his timing down with these new receivers? I, I don't know what the answer is. So I want to see on Saturday. I mean, I'm going to, the quarterbacks are the first thing I put that I'll be watching. They're the top thing that I'll be watching. I want to see Quinn and how his timing is with these receivers. I want to see if he can, hey, has he taken that next step? I mean, people say how, how comfortable he looks out there. So I want to see it for myself. We haven't really got to watch a lot of, or I guess any live action. We saw, you know, so we're routes on air. We haven't seen live action. So I want to see mm -hmm. looks as comfortable as sources have said he's looked. It's just his reads are quick and decisive. Uh, you know, and then we'll, obviously we'll see what kind of progress Arch made. I'll tell you what, man, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see Trey Owens, the freshman. And I know uh, uh, Sark today mentioned um, the kid Cole Lords. Cole Lord. yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, these guys have been in this system other than Trey, you know, multiple years now, all of them. So, there should be a level of comfort, and I'm, I'm kind of excited to see all of them, starting with Quinn, of course, Arch, and then I want to see Trey and Cole Lord as well. Put some respect on Cole Lord's name. Hey, dude, man. I love Cole Lord. I, Cole Lord came in as a preferred walk-on, and somebody tipped me off. So I, I got to know Cole, Cole and I broke that story. And, like, he's like the kind of kid you're like, okay, if that dude ever asked out my daughter, I'd be like, you better go out with him. He's a yes sir, no sir, like super kind, super polite guy. So, so good for good for Cole Lord, man. I like to see him having some success. Damn it. And, and damn it, Alex, I see your depth chart here that you send us. I think we need to add in a fourth guy. <laughs> just just saying, Alex. Is he on scholarship? I, I forgot. I don't is he on scholarship? think he is. I don't think he ever got put on scholarship. Scholarship guys only on the, de on the depth chart. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait. So did, what did you do with Michael Taff uh, the other years when he wasn't on scholarship but was playing a lot? I think well, I'll always make it. I'll always make a. Nah, uh, I see. I'll, always, I'll always make an exception for a Westlake Chaparral. <laughs> what, what about Quinn for you, Alex? Man, I just I I I think I'd like to just see Quinn. You know, I like to see Quinn go out there and look like he's looked. Man, I thought I think Quinn's looked awesome. I think he's slinging it, dude. I think he's dealing this spring, from what I've seen. So I I, I think that the fans could be excited about it. It was it was interesting, man. I feel like I've been hearing this kind of narrative a little bit lately. Earlier today, I recorded a three-hour draft preview show for SiriusXM that they're putting off across um, the Fantasy Sports channel. I, I think maybe a few other channels just to, to replay over the course of the next week. I did it with with Cody Carpentier, who's who's here at Orange Bloods too. And um, man, whenever we talked about some of these dudes like Worthy and Mitchell, JT Sanders and stuff, Art um, Quinn Ewers would just kind of come up in passing. And it's begun to feel like me, the feel to me like the whole Quinn Ewers thing is sort of tipped on its head from last year, where last year everybody was talking about how Quinn Ewers was just the nationally, you know, how he was the next coming, you know, the next big thing, just this elite prospect, all this stuff. It's where I was like, uh, well, I feel like I feel like I, I feel like I watch it pretty closely. I feel like I, I could maybe see a little bit more out of the guy, right? Mm -hmm. Now this spring, it's like these people come on and they're like, well, Texas runs this whack offense where it's this RPO, you know, this RPO system where they just give Quinn Ewers that one, you know, super easy first read and all this stuff. And, you know, Quinn's not that good, and, you know, stuff like this. And like that, that might have held back worthy because they couldn't connect and all that, you know, they've had trouble establishing a connection, yada, yada, yada. I mean, all talking points that we had last year at certain points, right? It was like, hey, what happened in this game? What was wrong with the connection here? You know, what, like what was misfiring here? But when I look back at the whole body of work, I I, I, I thought Quinn was good last year, man. You think about the think about the the Big 12 championship and some of these other games, man. I mean, Quinn, Quinn came to play a lot of the time and I really have been impressed with him this spring. I think he's looked, I think he's looked, steps ahead of where he was then i i think he's taking a step forward and it's just interesting to me now that i'm the one you know last year that was sort of kind of jason sukamel tapped the brakes ish about this guy whenever asked about him for people in the national media you know saying is you know is he gonna be a top 10 quarterback whereas now it's like it feels like people are down on him i'm like man you got like he's playing he's playing the best ball that i've seen him play right now so i, I hope he gets out there i hope he slings it I hope the Texas can see some 
good deep action, can see some of these deep balls that we've seen, some of these really, really, really pretty balls that he's placing in there. And also for me, something I haven't seen because we haven't got to watch any red zone team drills. I just hope that things look smooth in the red zone. It feels like that's something that we didn't see as much last year, but something that's been you know, reported to us is like, man, the offense had trouble getting drives going, but man, they got down into the red zone drills and boy, they were, you know, this like bang, bang, bang. It's like, wow, that's like bizarro world compared to what we saw in the actual games last year. So it would, it would be neat to, I think, see him connect on some deep balls with the Jonte Cooks, the Isaiah Bonds, the Matthew Goldens, the Ryan Wingos of the world. And also, you know, see how the passing game's going down there in the red zone and who, who the preferred targets are. Like that, those are the things that I'll be interested in seeing from Quinn Ewers. Jason, what does our world look like if Arch Manning has the performance that Malik Murphy had in the spring game of last year? Uh, there'll be a lot of talking points and a lot of a lot of buzz out from outside from the fans, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it matters, Anwar. This is one one practice. I mean, yes. You I don't think it. it would matter with that guy in that name if he no, put on. It'll matter. It'll, it'll it'll matter for Sports Center and stuff like exactly. That. Alex, Correct. it'll be a Correct. huge talking point. It'll be all over Orange Bloods, but you know, unless Alex wants to make me another bet, Quinn Ewers is the starting quarterback <laughs> week one. I don't care what happens between now and week one. Quinn's going to be the starter. All right, that's that's that that's fair enough. Um. After that, Alex, let's let's go to the to the running back position, Alex. Um, you know, we've we've heard, you know, we've obviously Jaden Blue has kind of been the buzz of camp. That's kind of been the, the the hot talking name. Seems like just about every scrimmage or practice, his name has has come up. Uh, we've heard Christian Clark. We've heard Jarrett Gibson. Uh, there's you know C.J. Baxter. We know uh, is the starter for you, Alex. You know what? Is there anything you need to see or want to see from from those running backs? Is there any question for you as far as who RB one is versus RB two? Like I'm just kind of see how do you break down that running back room? Well, I mean, I think there has to be a question for anybody. I think anybody saying that they know for a fact that CJ Baxter or Jaden Blues are ahead of the other, I think that that outside of the coaching staff, I think that would probably be kind of wrong, right? Because yeah. I mean, there's just so many, you know, on one side you have one Jaden blue, but by the eyeball test looked better last year, you know, down the stretch, you know, you have on this, in the same hand that all the reporting has been Jaden blue looks awesome. You know, you've, it's not just from the coaches. It's not just from the sources of practice. It's from like recruits, right. That Jason talks to, or it's like, so, you know, it's like no one has any sort of agenda when they're talking about Jaden blue. There's obviously something pretty cool going on with Jaden blue in practice on the other side. Every time I've been out there, it's always C.J. Baxter who's the first one up, and Sarkeesian loves him, and Sarkeesian would have started him over the guy that would have that would have won the Doak Walker Award last year had he not gotten hurt, Jonathan Brooks. You know what I mean? So, um, I, I don't. We're not going to get an answer as to which one's running back one or which one's running back two. I'm I'm not sure that the staff sees him in that way, as much as we kind of want to figure it out because. I mean, we can't help it. Say, like, dude, who's Sark's thousand yard rusher going to be? Right? It's, I mean, it's a it's a viable question to ask. It's a good, critical question to ask. If this offense is going to be run like Sark wants it to be run, we, we said we said it a million times. It's like he he has a thousand yard rusher. He can say he needs complimentary backs all day, and he has needed them. Right? But one has taken a definite back seat every time. It's like that's the way it goes. The way that their two bodies profile, it seems like Jaden Blue definitely profiles more to be the change of back, change of pace guy. But as he's gotten as he's gotten bigger and put on, what is his weight right now? Is it, do we've talked about this? Is one ninety five? Um, Jaden Blue, you're talking about? He's, yeah, he's number twenty three, right? So uh, one ninety eight. They've got him six foot one ninety eight. He's he's up to two hundred pounds. He can he can hold up at two hundred pounds at college football, man. So. If he makes a bunch of these flash plays, if C.J. Baxter continues to look like he looked last season as far as his indecision and, and some of the stuff with his vision and things like that, I would think that that, that to me wouldn't necessarily say that C.J. Baxter's bad or that he's done or that he's certainly behind Jaden Blue or whatever, you know, but I think that would crack open the door. To, I don't think that – I don't think that the, the discrepancy in size between the two dudes necessarily is going to dictate which one's sort of the 1A versus who's the 1B, right? And I think we're going to need to wait to find that out. I think Jaden Blue, if you just judge it on the eyeball test, has kind of looked a little bit better 
looked a little bit more well-rounded. 200 pounds can hold up. Christian McCaffrey held up at the college level weighing just that much. I mean, Austin Eckler. Uh, so, um, so Demi, Alex, let me ask you this then. If that's the battle for RB1 and RB2. Well, right. I, the, the next thing I was going to say was that, I mean. Three and four then. It's pretty, like, it's pretty. Uh, that's a 1A, 1B, I think, more than a RB1, RB2, right? Yeah. Um, and so now once we have that established, now you start thinking, well, what about all this stuff? Like we're hearing about Trey Wisner, who looked really good last year, mm-hmm. and Christian Clark, who to me looks like the better player just right off the hoof, right, than Jarrett Gibson. But who knows what that can mean? We're talking based on seeing him at four practices for like five periods of, of practice, right? But Christian Clark to me has looked like a dude who you can deploy in all kinds of ways, maybe has a little bit better hands maybe a little bit sleeker with the, with the way he moves, lateral agility, just a little bit more twitchy, whereas Gibson looks a little bit more like a uh, a power ahead, just um, battering ram, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, 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 mean, I have no idea how those guys stack up, especially in a situation where after this spring game, you know, pe- pe- people are going to have to go into the portal and – you know, would if, if you're Trey Wisner and all these guys are running ahead of you, it feels like Wisner's a guy who they want to keep, right? And if you got all these guys kind of running ahead of you, you know, what what do you what 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 does that what does that do for the coaching staff to 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 do that? You know what I mean? If he's a guy that they want to keep, you just put Christian Clark and you put you know Jared Gibson and maybe Savion Red and mix him in with a third group or something like that, but give Wisner some some shine, maybe playing kind of behind those two dudes. That could make sense just from a pure, you know, um, team chemistry standpoint. I'm not sure if they'll do it. That might be something I would consider doing. But yeah, man, like if we're just if we're talking about how I stack them up, just as as players after them, I think that I would put after those two guys. I think I would put Clark and Wisner as two that are kind of just tied after those guys. Mm-hmm. And after that, you know, Gibson and who knows was who who knows was Savion Red. That whole thing's been really weird this this spring. That's what I was going to ask you, Jason. It it, it seemed like. We've got, you know, to, to Alice's point, right? I think it's a good one, right? It's we're kind of talking about one A, one B as it relates to the starting guy, right? And then we're kind of like we've got that Trey Wisner, like we're talking about Christian Clark, Jarrett Gibson thing. We've got that mix in there. And then there is Savion Red. And mm-hmm. I, what does that mean for a guy who did have a package last year for you know a, a period of time? And it seemed to be a guy that was kind of in the mix. You know, he shows up to, to camp, you know, weighs too much. Obviously, the staff is not too happy about where that is. And Sark said they had time to to shed some of those pounds. But what does that mean for a guy like Savion? Does it just mean he's just got to stay the course? Or I'm just kind of curious about that. Uh, yeah. You know, first off, Savion is lucky he's young because he can shed those pounds pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> unlike us older, <laughs> dudes, right? But, you know, I mean, listen, I mean, he had a – you know, pretty specific, not a pretty, a very specific package last year. And I'm not sure that Christian Clark or Jared Gibson couldn't fill that, that role. So he they don't need that package. They really don't. I mean, if, if, but if they use it, you're, I agree with you, Alex, but if they go to it, I think any of the other backs could really use it. I mean, um, that package was a payback to Savion Red for playing the role of Jalen Milrow and simulating him in practice and them getting that win. And they're like, man, when he, when he was quarterback, he was making plays doing the Milrow thing. Well, he is a physical runner. So, I mean, I think it was fine at first. You know, I mean, he can fall forward and get you those short yardage gains. But I just don't know what his role is going to be. I mean, we said 1A and 1B. I mean, Trey Wisner has had a fantastic spring. I mean, every seems like every time we check around, his name comes up. It happened again uh, over the weekend. So I mean, he's going to figure in. And today, point. Stark mentioned him, by the way. Today he did? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so I didn't. I missed that. But uh, yeah, I mean, seriously, I mean, from Sark and just other sources, every time we check in, it's like, man, Trey Weiser is making plays. So uh, the true freshmen look good. So, um, you know, there's a boy, that's a loaded room, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how they disperse those carries on Saturday, and is there a true pecking order? Is it Baxter then Blue? Or are they going to mix it up? Hey, Alex, I was actually talking about uh, you and Cody Carpentier uh, over the weekend. What was the the bet that Cody placed? I think y'all were in Indianapolis. It was Jaden Blue to go for a thousand yards, right? Oh, I forgot what that was, but Cody was Cody Cody bucks. got it at like four hundred to one or something. Yeah, dude, that's what I, was, I, said, I think it was like five bucks. <laughs> like a thousand. I said I'm going to Vegas in May. I've already got plans. I'm 
betting on that. When I get to yeah. Vegas, dude, I'm going to – first thing I do is I'm going to the sports book and, like, give me some money on Jaden Blue to go for a How thousand. much will you put? About $100 on that one, Jason? How I much? might. Like, he, Cody put five bucks. I'm like, uh-uh, I'm putting, like, 50 because that would pay – 10 grand or something insane. So to me, like if, if CJ Baxter hey, Venmo you some money, man, before you right, go, I'll, I will put the wager down for you, man. Um, because I'm like, you know, what Baxter durability issues last year. I mean, Jaden Blue may wind up getting the starting role regardless. So um, dude, yeah, I was serious. I was talking to some guys about that on Saturday. I was like, man, the dude that works with us did this, and I said, I'm gonna do it when I'm out there in uh, the first weekend of May on Mars. So or so, whatever, early May. So uh, yeah, you let me know, my man. We'll 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 ride that train together. But um, yeah, to, to get back on point, lots of talent in the running back room. Um, you know, again, I don't want to make too much out of one practice, one spring game, but you know, it might give us a little glimpse of, of uh, maybe how they're going to use Blue and how, versus Baxter. How big of a, a role is Trey Wiseman going to have? And Trey's a versatile dude. I mean. You know, he, he brings a little bit different. He's got kind of some Jaden Blue speed to him, but he's also a threat as a receiver. So, you know, uh, Trey does some different things, kind of maybe a little bit differently than some of these other guys. So it'll be be inter interesting to see how they use him. All right, Alex, let's go, let's go O-line before we have the uh, – we get into the really, really tough stuff with the, the receivers and the tight end. So let's let's go O-line for you, Alex. Uh, the, th the thing you may have your eye on the guys that you may have your eye on from the starting position like give me the 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 guys who already just check the box got, that's my kelvin banks ain't got nothing else to think about um and then give me the other guys who are you know maybe kind of in the mix can you just maybe handicap that the whole offensive line room well kelvin banks is Got my guy, nothing else to think about, whatever it was you were doing. Like, what, what are you counting out money with it or something? Yeah, or, just buy it. Right. Okay, so Kelvin Banks, I got nothing else to do with it, just money in the bank. Uh, Jake Majors, money in the bank. Um, oh, K DJ Campbell, money in the bank. And then Cam Williams, maybe not money in the bank, but maybe just like, man, I feel good. I feel really good about Cam Williams. And um, I think, you know, Cam Williams is a guy who, 20 percent of me feels like you know this time next year we'll be talking about where where he goes in the draft like where where's where's draft slotting is so um you know the thing with him this year has been fixing the mistakes we saw last year that he was serviceable even with the mistakes he committed the tfls the run stuffs and the the penalties of course, those are all things that I chart as far as the responsibility for these guys. And I always said, man, he grades so highly on all his other plays that if he can just cut back on the mistakes, he's going to be grading out about like Kelvin Banks or about like DJ Campbell on one of his best games just because what, you know, what, what, what he brings is so dominant. It's not just the way – it's not just his size, but it's the way he moves. It's his speed. It's his length. It's the impossibility of converting – outside speed to inside power against him you you just you you can't try to come outside on him with speed and then convert a, across his chest plate there's just too much too much real estate and he's just he's too strong you know so uh it's, he's a really hard guy to convert against and generally whenever you see a guy that's what six 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 i don't even know how tall he is he's you know whatever he's he's, a, he's as tall as a door Whenever you see a guy like that, you think to yourself, okay, well, he's going to get overextended out over the balls of his feet. I'm going to be able to convert across his chest plate easily. It's just – it's 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 not easy with Cam. So, uh, I feel good about him. I think the only weird, weird deal is at left guard with Hayden Connor. We've seen Nato Yamusolo um, work in there at the right guard with Hayden Connor playing at second team center. I wouldn't be surprised, guys. I think Hayden Connor still is the starting left guard. He kind of has been ever since that one, that third week of practice, wherever they messed around with that thing. But, but I would not be surprised if in the spring game we saw Connor as the second team center. They just they, they sometimes do stuff like that, and I feel the, like the reason why is this: the we've heard from sources that the second team offensive line has had some trouble getting the getting the push, you know that that that, that they would really like and. Uh, maybe getting Hayden Connor in there brings a stabilizing force. It also gives them a whole – dude, they have enough tape on Hayden Connor at left guard. Like, how much more tape do you need at Hayden Connor at left guard? You have two years' worth of actual games. You know, get a, get, get, get a full spring game of tape on um, on NATO and on Cole Hudson at, at left guard and get a whole spring game of tape on Hayden Connor at center. 
I'm not saying I'm predicting it. I'm not saying I've heard it's going to happen. I'm saying I could easily see that happening, though. And I think that people would have a huge overreaction saying, oh, my God, NATO is going to start. And I'd have to come and I'd have to come back and say, no, it's it wasn't that 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 wasn't what that was. That, that was about getting tape at different positions. So um, that would be the way I see it. I feel good about Hayden Connor at left guard. I feel good that NATO has pushed him. Right. Mm-hmm. I feel good about Cole Hudson's ability to be a swing guy at any of the inside Offensive line spots, left guard. Cole Hudson could play center. He could play right guard. He started at right guard as a freshman. So, yeah, I mean, as far as the starters, it's, it feels pretty solid to me. Now, with the second group, the only issue is we had Trevor Goosby missing time with a concussion. I'm assuming he's back from that. Um, and even with uh, Peyton Kirkland now going to the transfer portal, he was only playing as the third team right guard. He was playing behind Connor Stroh. And so with – the second team of Gooseby, uh, NATO at left guard, either Connor or Connor Robertson at center, Cole Hudson at right guard, and then Kojo at right tackle. That's been what they've been doing all all spring. So even even though they haven't been getting as much push as we might like, there's at least that continuity there. And I don't think there's too. I don't. I think that left guard with the first group and how that thing works and stuff like that. That's the only real question that I have as far as the offensive line. I think we've even we basically even down to the third offensive line. We can basically figure out what it's going to be without too much to worry about. All right, so we've got we've got the O line taken care of. All right, Let, let's I, I'll, I'll let's do the co-main event. Um, let's do the tight ends before we get to the main event. Let's do the tight end. So I think Jason and and Alex, I think Gunnar Helm for both of you guys is is the number one uh, pretty much going into this game and probably coming out of spring, right? So no mm. real thoughts. Or, or Jason, you, yeah, okay, you're a little hesitant on that one. I don't. I think it'll be that. Nye Black when he's healthy, but uh, you know he came in a little banged up, right? But uh, I don't know that you know it'll be one of those two, obviously. But um, I don't know that I, in my mind, I put it in ink that Gunnar Helm is going to be your you know, the first tight end uh, to take the field. Uh, I think Nyblack, you bring a guy like that in, I think, you know, to come in and potentially start. So, um, you know, interestingly, I don't remember hearing his name, Nyblack. I mean, I know early in the spring he was dinged up, right? He was, is he, do we know, is he back to full strength? We heard. He's, yeah. Well, I don't know if he's back to full strength. He's, he's out there every practice. Yeah. He was out there when, even in the early practices, but uh you know, he was run. He would literally. I remember the first couple of practices. He'd be the he was, last tight end to. He was to running behind the backups. Yeah, well, he was, I mean, he was running behind the walk-ons. But he was banged up right on where didn't he come in? Yeah, he was. He was his ankle. He had an ankle injury. Yeah. Um, but in two scrimmages ago, he he caught a touchdown late in the scrimmage. So, okay. uh, so he he is back. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but uh, you know, I would probably agree that I think Gunnar Helms certainly going into this game and maybe moving forward is probably the number one tight end, but I think Nye Black's going to push him for sure. Uh, Alex, you have the, the, the numbers. It's kind of putting you on the spot for a second, but the tight end distribution last year, as far as his playing time is, is concerned, as far as the percentages are concerned, what did that look like with Jatavian as far as snaps are concerned and with Gunner Helm? Cause I'm just kind of curious, like when it's all said and done, does it matter who is tight end one or tight end two and, uh, you know, how much 12 personnel do we see? Like all those kind of little things. Well, it doesn't matter who's tight end one and two's tight end two. Uh, but if you just look at it last year, JT Sanders was tight end one. If you look at snaps, he played 71% of snaps. Gunnar Helm played 55% of snaps. But the important thing to look at that would be the tight end usage as far as alignments. And it's obvious that Gunnar Helm is going to play the Gunnar Helm role, right? Which he was the guy – the, who played 40% in line, right? Attached to the line of scrimmage, old fashioned tight end, right? Line up with your hand in the dirt next to the tackle. Sometimes you block a guy. Sometimes you run out with a little tight end drag or, you know, you, you know, a little dump route, stuff like that, seam stuff. Um, whereas uh, he, he was there 40% of the time. By far, you know, JT Sanders was, was in line 20% of the time. So he was, he was in line double the amount that JT Sanders was. Uh, Gunnar Helm played, so he played 40% of the snaps. And look, I'm rounding. It's 39.16, but basically 40% of snaps in line. He played 50% of snaps at H-back, and he basically played 10% of snaps. It split out. It's almost exactly what it was. 40 in line, 
50 at H back. So 50 at that spot where they're kind of got their hand in the dirt back there mm-hmm. offset with a quarterback or maybe where they're not on the line of scrimmage, but they're sort of in that same alignment, but they're backed up on it with their, with their face mask sort of near the hip pad of the offensive tackle, right? They're kind of offset like that. And they will be, you know, in that case, in, when, in those cases, whenever they do that, it's usually a split zone concept, wherever they, they take the, whenever the offensive line, run zone like this, they run the opposite way and they go and hit the um the defensive end that's left open that the that the left tackle, say in this case, would have left unblocked, right? The end man on the line, they go block that guy for the for for the, for the cutback in these split zone and zone slice concepts. So you need a you need to be a good blocker in that spot. JT Sanders failed a lot last year in that spot. He played there 60% of the time. He was in line 20% of the time, and he was split out tw- uh, 20% of the time. So basically, JT Sanders, his role is the role that I think Nye Black will eventually move into, where he's playing double the amount of time split out. He's playing as Gunnar Helm. He's playing half the time in line, and he's playing 10% more of the time at H-back. And if he does play that role that JT Sanders played last year, and Gunnar Helm plays the same role he played this year, then Nye Black would be the tight end one by the um by the by the snap percentages because that's what JT Sanders was last year and they utilized that tight end in this offense as part of the platoon more frequently than they do the more inline tight end like Gunnar Helm plays. So j- this leads into this Jason T- today I didn't have it necessarily in my report but it, it, I may put something to com- on compile this Alex once again and I I, I know I called out mentioned this to Jason once again today, Steve Sarkeesian mentions Juan Davis. Hmm. And he's asked about, hey, you know, are there any guys who basically end up being a little bit more competitive than you had expected? And he goes, well, he starts off by saying, like, no, not really, because if we, we wouldn't have recruited them if they weren't, you know, competitive or anything like that. But he goes, but he goes, but I do like a guy. And he said, for example, Juan Davis. He goes, sometimes you're a scout team player. and You're kind of in the background a little bit with JT and Gunner. Uh, that maybe not all your competitive spirit gets to come out all the time. But he goes, but now he's really rolling. He's in there with the ones, and he's playing good football. I'm probably seeing more of his competitive spirit more than before. Uh, we knew that it was there. Uh, there's more coming out of him. So he goes, that's an example of that. And he continues to mention Juan Davis. This is not – a one-time thing. Like, it, it has literally come up at nearly every press conference. I hear Gunner. I hear Nine Black. But can I hear anything about the potential of Juan Davis? Is that as a guy who's being overlooked by any stretch of the imagination? Jason, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think so. I mean, listen, you know, he had flashes when he was real young, but then he kind of went underground when JT Sanders came in. But um when Texas recruited him, this was Tom Herman's staff that recruited Juan Davis. And they didn't, I remember talking to someone, they didn't like him being listed as a tight end. They said, just list him as an offensive athlete because this guy can do so many different things uh, more than just a traditional tight end. He can be an H back. He can play running back. Uh, I mean, he, if you look at his high school film, man, out of Everman, he dominated at the high school level. So he's always been a really good, unique athlete with, good size that can do a lot of things that guys his size can't do. Uh, like I said, he could play running back in a pinch. So um, not totally surprised on war to hear his name come up. I mean, I think he could certainly have a role. I mean, you've got the top two guys, right? We assume we're going to be uh, Gunnar Helm and Nye Black, but you know, you're going to need a third in there at some point. And it, I would, I mean, no offense to Spencer Shannon or Will Randall, but I don't think they've done a lot. Jordan Washington is still young, obviously tons of upside there. But, yeah, I mean, I could see Juan Davis certainly carving out a role in this offense with his versatility. And obviously it sounds like he's had a really good spring. So uh, it would be interesting to see what he can do, uh, you know, starting on Saturday and then obviously carrying into the fall. Alex, are you buy, you, will you buy any Juan Davis stock? I mean, I just I don't think Amari Nyblack comes here to lose a job to Juan Davis. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll eat my words if that's wrong. But I mean, I've seen what Nye Black did versus like Jade Barron in Tuscaloosa at, at night last year. Like I've I've never seen Juan Davis do that stuff on a college football field. So we'll see. I mean, I think Juan Davis has looked good so far. You know, I, I think he's looked good so far. I think um, 
you know, it, and it, dude, if he did, it would be a great story. I'm not anticipating it, but it's like, who knows? Uh, like I wouldn't have, an- would have anticipated that the Juan Davis thing would have gone on this far. So who knows? I might not be good at anticipating the whole Juan Davis thing. Okay. Um, all right. Let's last one. Alex, I, I, I do shows with you every day. So I already know where you are as relates to receivers for the moment. So I got I'm going to I'm going back. On, and of course we did a show last week that clearly us uh, you know stirred the pot and, and got everybody kind of worked up uh I, 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 I told you all that was choosing violence I told hey you. but you know what you know what choosing violence n- n- nonetheless uh other people ended up saying the same exact things that we had said yeah. uh that was that was said on the show so it is what it is all yeah. right jason <laughs> we've got we've got we got three transfer with the two transfers that are in here um We've got some incumbents. We've got the John T. Cooks. We've got Ryan Wingo. Um, you know, I, I, I even Sart mentioned Park and Livingstone today, uh, having you know, a good performance and having a good touchdown. Right. Yeah, your guy there. So I'm just kind of curious. I'm kind of curious, Jason. Where is this wide receiver room for you? Because it seems it's about as wide open, no pun intended, as we've seen in a long time. Yeah, it was one of the things I wrote about in my three, two, one today that I will be watching anxiously watching uh, on Saturday. Um, man, there's so many storylines. I mean, is Ryan Wingo is all the freshman hype legit? Uh, are these transfers Golden and Bond? We keep hearing different days, different things. You know, this guy did well this day, and Golden made plays this day. So, you know, are they truly going to come in and just slide right in and be number one type players? Um, is DeAndre Moore, does he have that slot spot locked in? Like it seems like he does, right? Um, you mentioned Parker Livingstone. John Tay Cook, still the story for me, dude. I love me some John Tay. And like, I know y'all y'all ruffled some feathers with your headline last week, but I ain't worried about John Tay, dude. John Tay. You know, the headline, <laughs> not the context of what we talked about. Which I didn't John see Tay. the show. I didn't remember the headline. Of, yeah, the context the was of, absolutely not. You shouldn't be worried about it. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Yes. I, and, and, I, and I said I was like maybe 10% concerned at most. <laughs> But nobody, uh, nobody actually listened to what we said. They just, they just read, look, 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 look with a headline. Green cap through the headline and blast it on Twitter, and it and goes just, from there, right? So, so for the sake, so I said, Jason, this is the thing. This, this is where it became a little bit. If Alex and I just had said yes, then there's no, con- there's no conversation. So I, said, I said, Alex, let me play devil's advocate for the sake of argument, and I threw some things out there, and that's when I'm like, oh my god, he's anti. I was like, no, I literally said. Let me play devil's advocate, and I was yeah. like, ah, I got ten percent worry. Nonetheless, it is. It you is. Got to have a point and counterpoint to have a little conversation. Have a right? conversation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and knowing Jonte, you know, and Jonte like seemed to take it in stride. You saw, I saw his Twitter response. He's like, "What are y'all bored or something?" Right. So, you know, Jonte, he's never one to back away from uh, social media conversations and talking about himself. But, um, uh, yeah, man, Jonte is going to be fine. And, you know, listen, knowing what I know about Jonte and his personality and having recovered him as a recruit, Jonte had a touchdown at the scrimmage on Saturday. Maybe you guys lit a fire in him. I don't know. Knowing what I know of Jonte, he'll probably come out and ball out on Saturday and uh, just to quiet any potential criticism. But, um, yeah, the wide receiver room is fascinating, man. I mean, and we're not even, you know, the, um, the kid from Oregon or young man from Oregon State that's coming in. I was bowling. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'm. I'm anxious. I wish we could see him out there on Saturday. I mean, I'm real curious to see his speed and how Sark utilizes him. But yeah. there's a lot of depth, dude. Like, I remember it was. I think it was the first scrimmage of the spring, and I was talking to a couple different sources that were there, and I remember they said, and to me, this still holds true. Two weeks later, they said this may be a year. You know, Sark usually has his top guys, and it's usually like three guys who dominate the snap count. It's this, these people are like. This may be the year where he truly has a two deep at receiver and they all play similar snap counts. And I could certainly see that. And it's, I mean, I don't know who is above who on the pecking order right now between Bond and Wingo and DeAndre Moore and Jonte and Golden. And I mean, you mentioned Parker Livingston. So, um, yeah, man, this might be a, a year where they kind of share the wealth a little bit more than we've seen in previous years under Sark. Uh, you, you can certainly see four or five, maybe even six guys, you know, getting considerable action. And I think we'll see a lot of those guys get a lot of touches starting this Saturday. But what if, okay. And, and by the way, 
before I get to you, Alex, uh, Jason, what do you make of, of a guy like Ryan Wingo? I mean, he he has had a buzz throughout camp. We've got mm-hmm. you've you've had reports. Alex has had reports. Steve Sarkeesian has talked about Ryan Wingo a lot. Um, you covered him. You, that's a guy you covered in high school as well. I'm just kind of what you thought on Ryan Wingo also going into the spring game. Big physical elite athlete. Um, I mean, he was an elite athlete at the high school level, six two, and you know verified i forget what his trap times are off the top of my head but he was burning in the 100 meters uh he's comes to austin for a semester and i remember talking to people close to him and they're just like dude what he's done with his body in the first three months in austin or what texas has helped him do with his body has been incredible and i remember talking to a source after a scrimmage and the description was grown ass man so this is a grown ass man as a freshman who can just run past you, dude. I mean, and he's got incredible work ethic too. So, um, you know, I want to see it with my own eyes. As Alex noted earlier, I'm usually a guy that says, all right, slow down a little bit. I, I want to see it with my own eyes before I'm ready to believe all, all the behind the scenes hype, but not too surprised. I mean, this is a guy who was a five-star uh, recruit for the most of the recruiting cycle. He ended up dropping just out of five-star status with the very last rankings update. But I mean, he was you know, ranked as an elite player and one of the best in the country. And there's a reason every school in the country uh, would have taken his commitment. So um, not totally surprised. The thing, I guess the one thing that surprises me, Anwar, is that he's, he's been able to make such a splash in such a deep wide receiver room. Okay. That's what surprised me because there's so many experienced guys ahead of him. I didn't think he'd have much of a chance to really make a big dent this early just because of the transfer guys and because of Jonte. But he's come in and held his own against some of those more experienced guys. That part has been surprising. But, I mean, he's always been a a player with tremendous, tremendous uh, physical and just God-given upside. Alex, give give me your breakdown of that that wide receiver battle that we're going to see. You know, we'll we'll, we'll see it in person. I'll just kind of give you your, your breakdown of it. I don't think there's a battle with Jonte Cook. I don't think there's a battle with DeAndre Moore. I think that the battle is with Isaiah Bond and Ryan Wingo at X. You know, I think that that's the deal. I think that uh, Matthew Golden has looked like he's been just a consistent feature with the second offense that has just moved from side to side with the uh, both the X and the Z spots. He played a bunch of Z at U of H. That's where he put, uh, that's where he mostly played. He played some slot, but outside of the slot, he was mo- he was mainly at the Z. It's just gonna be interesting to see how they kind of fit them all in. I wouldn't be surprised if we do see. You know, they said today, I thought it was interesting what Sark said when I was reading your write-up, something about they're going to break them up into groups. They're going to get some good teams. They're going to be good matches for each other. I wonder if that might kind of throw our sin off of who the kind of starters are and who they're just kind of putting on each team, right, to to to, to make things maybe more even. But the more I thought about that, I'm like, man, they've, ne- they've never done that in the past. It's always been the first offensive line guys are out there with the first tight end and the first quarterback and the starting wide receivers and the starting running back. Mm -hmm. And then, you know what I'm saying? It's like saying they'll split guys up. I I don't, I don't really know what that means. It's just kind of like, I was like, what could that mean? Just kind of put that in my back pocket. But I I would imagine that I, if I put my money on it, I think we go out there and we see the first group just for the first time we go out there. It'll be, um, it'll be one, in one at Z, zero at slot, seven at um, X. So Bond, Cook, Moore. And then with the second group, I think it would be Golden, Niblet, Wingo. And I think the only one that where there's really somebody pushing would be the Wingo stuff because we know that Wingo started over Bond for a whole entire scrimmage in that second scrimmage of the season. And he's had a bunch of good, you know, a, a, a bunch of good reviews. So, um, mm-hmm. I mean, if we, dude, if we, oh gosh, I mean, if we go out there and we see some kind of Jonte Cook and Ryan Wingo on the field at the same time with the ones, ooh, that would, I mean, I'm just not saying it would be great because that would mean that, I'm not saying that would mean he's ahead of Bond or anything like that, but it would certainly show that like all this stuff we've heard behind the scenes has been, that hadn't been smoke, man. There's some real fire to it. Let me, the last thing before we do some parting shots, Alex, I, I do, I, let me ask you this, and I'm not, what the question I'm going to ask you, Alex, I won't hold you to because it's April the 16th, you know, at nearly 5 p.m. I'm not going to have you predict anything that's going to happen in September, okay? But Sark did say that the reason they went into the portal is because they he looked on his roster and he had a lot of guys that lacked experience 
And he wanted to bring in guys who had the experience. So that's why they went to the portal to get the bolt goldens and the bonds and, and, and every, and the other, the other guy. Right. So in your mind, I, I know where we're at today. If he went out and deliberately said, Hey, I need to get veterans out here because I just can't roll with a guy with a lot of inexperience. Do you see a world? Where Cook is the starter and, and Moore is the starter. And when he went out there deliberately to make sure I got guys who actually have experience. I don't see a world. I I I, I would be shocked if it wasn't that world. Okay. Why why give me give me an explanation as to why? Because I don't I mean, talent trumps experience. I'm just like to I I mean, I don't like they want experience in the room, and you get Matthew Golden in there, and the the with Matthew Golden, the the trap door with him, the the easy out with him was always just look. You get experience in the wide receiver room, and if he comes in and he doesn't crack onto the starting group, we still have him as a rotational guy. That's always been a fifteen to twenty percent snap share kind of guy on, on offense, and we have him be our star kick returner, punt returner. You know, like that's what that's what, go back to go back to Sark's breakdown and his debrief of the Houston game and listen to how much he talks about Matthew Golden it wasn't about defending him as a receiver it was about de defending him as as a, as a returner on special teams so I, I've always thought that that was a the minute they talked about Golden I was like oh gosh well, yeah, they want him as their returner don't you remember how much they talked about how much they talked about Golden before and after that game you know mm -hmm. so yeah I mean I wouldn't be surprised at all. Jonte Cook has been the starter the whole sp spring I know he's had some down practices and he's had some drops and stuff but he, like it's been Bond who's been getting pushed from all we know. It had like who knows, maybe a practice, you know, like I mean, Jonte's getting pushed all the time and we're just not hearing about it from sources or whatever, but it it doesn't feel that way for me. The thing with DeAndre Moore, I'm not quite as sure about it with him as I am with Cook, but I just I don't see Jonte Cook being supplanted. Dude, Jonte Cook is so good, man. I just I don't see him being sub 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 supplanted, not by Matthew Golden and um with DeAndre Moore, it's just tough because you don't know. It doesn't feel like anybody else is really playing slot. There's only one scholarship slot guy behind him. So can somebody else move inside? Silas Bolden, whenever he gets in here, he'd be like the least likely. Dude, Silas Bolden last year played 80 something percent of his snaps outside. So I don't really know how to I don't really know how to um answer that riddle except for to say just it's my opinion, and you were the one that talked to Chris Jackson about this, so you would be able to be to to you know bleed the nuance out of it better than I would just hearing it secondhand from you. But to me, whenever you explain it to me, I say I think about just getting more experience. I means getting more experience into the room, not necessarily getting more experience onto the starting group. If if you, if you bring more experience into the room, and there's a ta and there's somebody more talented that you would rather have in the starting group, I just think talent trumps the experience. You want the experience for the for the for the room, right? For the for the learning environment and for the culture, as opposed to for the actual players on the football field. Um, Alice, uh, Jason, just real quick, because uh, I think this actually is a good um, question by Bob, and this is kind of relates to you, maybe in the uh, the recruiting realm as as, as well. Um, do you, what do you think about Michigan going on on probation? Do you think that opens up any portal movement for Michigan? And let me just build on that. I also is Jason. Um, does that it, does that affect Michigan from a recruiting standpoint? Are they going to serve three years of an NCAA probation, pay a fine, uh, and face recruiting restriction? Um, this is kind of an agreement that they reached that was announced on Tuesday. Um, there's also going to be a one year show cause for certain individuals. Of course, we you know why Jim Harbaugh left, right? It just can you not go to the playoff? Uh, I don't, I'm, if they're on NCAA probation, I don't, I would, I would imagine that would mean no. Uh, Three years of that, yes. Yeah, so. I doubt that's, I bet they, I don't know what the probation is, but I, I don't think they're going to keep him out of the playoff for three straight years. Um, in Huh? This is a preliminary. I again, I haven't had a chance to read all of it, but yeah. just just your list, just some general thoughts, and we'll get into minutia about it. So uh, we all can go through it. My general thoughts. This is the same Bob Wyndham that was shitting on us in the chat a little bit ago, so we shouldn't take his question. <laughs> um, <laughs> secondly, uh, all hugs and loves, brother. All <laughs> hugs and loves, Jason. Secondly, um, 
if those guys were going to the transfer portal, they had an opportunity when Harbaugh left. So, I mean, I know, I know some people keep talking about the defensive tackle, but I think that stuff's probably overblown. Those guys had their chance. They hired from within. So everybody seems to like the, uh, you know, the guy that they, the, he was their interim coach last year when Harbaugh was out. People really liked him inside the program. The players love him. So I don't know that we'll see a wave of transfers. Could it impact them recruiting? I don't know specifically what their recruiting restrictions are. I need to read up on it. But um, it could impact them. But it's Michigan, guys. It's Michigan. It's like it's Ohio State. It's Texas. It's Alabama. If they're winning on the field, those guys aren't going to give a crap about, you know, little little disciplines or some guy having a show calls. Now, if they can't play in the college football playoff, that's a big deal. But um, I'd be surprised if that was part of the probation. But, uh, yeah, um, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. If Michigan slides, I don't think it's going to be because of this. I think it's going to be because uh, Jim Harbaugh is not there leading the charge anymore and, and – uh, what's the new coach, Sharon? What's his last name? Sharon, Moore, I believe. Is it Moore? Is it Moore? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe uh, maybe he's just not up to up to the task. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it'll have a huge impact. I guess is the short of it, short answer of it. Yeah. Let, let's let's be clear. Bob did shit on us by saying he <laughs> we are his fifth favorite podcast. But you know what? What do you, you say we are? Yeah, he did. He did. He did. What did he say? What did he say? I, he said I, we, I we were his his fifth favorite uh, podcast. Fifth favorite fifth in favorite world? Texas podcast, not just no. in the world. Just yeah, get out of here. What are we talking? Fifth favorite Texas. You podcast. know what? You know what? You know what? We got to hug. We have we have to love on our enemies. All right. right? You know, love on love on our enemies. I'm fifth still riding favorite. the glow there, of my are there Easter four Sunday others? service. Golly. There, 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 no, there, no, there's not. <laughs> oh, my friend, I don't even know. <laughs> Bobby has his channel. There's Texas. Wait, wait, wait. There's Texas Sports Unfiltered. That would be two. There's Inside Texas. Texas, uh, there'd be 24 7. So, yeah, there actually would be five. <laughs> so, we're dead so last. Technically, we would be the. <laughs> <we would> <laughs> hey, even though, even thanks though, for watching, Bob. At least he's watching. Yeah. Hey, at least, even though our sub numbers are probably only under. Um, uh, Bobby, who's you know, that our sub numbers only under him, but nonetheless, it's okay, Bob. Bob, <laughs> I, I, hugs and loves, brother. Hugs and loves from your from your favorite uncle. Uh, he's probably like, I, you're Bob, come out to guy. our uh, come out to our happy hour on Friday. I'll buy you a beer, Bob. Speaking we'll, we'll, we'll break of bread. happy hour, thank you for reminding me, Bob Money B. Haters and lovers alike, <laughs> this Friday, Orange Blood sk- Spring Game Mixer. This Friday at the pitch from 6 to 9 p.m. The whole crew is going to be out there. If you haven't been to a pitch, they've got uh they got a bar out there, they got tons of food trucks, they got uh, a sand um pit over there where kids can play uh soccer. It's a lot of fun. You come out and hang out with us the night before the spring game. We don't know what the weather's gonna look like, so you come out with us on Friday night, hang out. It's gonna be a fun time. Uh, bring your friends, enemies, bring Bob, tell everybody to come. <laughs> we'll have a good time. Hey, real quick, Jason, you got a parting shot? I actually have a parting shot. Do you want me to just wrap it up? No, wrap hey, it up, man. Money B, I want Money B said, I want my beer Friday. Come on, Money B. Hey, I want to meet you, brother. So you come out and you get a beer on me. I hope you. I, I think I've promised. This is like my fourth person. I've said, "Hey, come out!" And I'm so I better, I better bring some cash. <laughs> yeah, money B, come on out, dude. I'd like to meet you if you're available. Jason's yeah. cheap ass. You better, you better capitalize on that. Of course, Jason won't pay up, so don't even worry about It'll it. It'll be like a bush light, like a small, like a cheap ass beer. But uh, no, I'll buy you a beer, money beer. I'd love, you're a big supporter of us. I'd love to. Love to meet you, dude. So come on out and uh, hopefully see you there on Friday. I'll be out there as well. Alex will be there as well. And in fact, Alex and I will be back tomorrow for our fun buy or sell. I don't know what we're going to discuss, but we we ruffled feathers last week. So we'll see what happens. I don't think we're going to have a repeat of anything like that. So uh, for Jeff Ketchum, for Alex Dunlap, for Jason Sukamel, uh, you guys enjoy the rest of your uh, what, Tuesday. What is today? Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, 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 Tuesday. Hopefully, hey Alex, that rain, by the way, that rain helped. Did it help your your lake levels at all? <sighs> we need biblical rain to help these lake levels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't you don't want to get me started, man? We'll we'll go way over an hour, dog. All right, I, I'll, I'll do I'll do a buy or sell for you on that one tomorrow. Yeah. All right, guys, everyone, take care. We'll be.